For students to learn, we need them to want to learn. Curiosity is the fuel of education. I'm Dan Finkel. I'm a PhD in mathematics and the founder of Math for Love. I've come to Australia to see how rich mathematical experiences can transform the learning of students and the practice of teachers. When it comes to rich tasks, preparation is key. Give yourself at least a half hour to read over the task and anticipate how students might respond to it. If anyone asks, you have my permission to avoid worrying about skills practice or even assessment. Preparing for one of these tasks, I think it's very important to have it. And that way you can sort of anticipate the different directions that students might take with it. I think if you don't have that deep understanding, then you might be tempted to sort of narrow things down into uh, your way of addressing the issue, which is not necessarily good. You want these things to be open-ended and again, more playful, less structure um, than you might have in some sort of other context with maths. If you like writing learning intentions, I encourage you to use intentions that actually reflect the values of the task. Things like, today success means finding a pattern or making a conjecture, or defending or critiquing someone's argument. Let's explore how to launch rich tasks. One of our first jobs as teachers is to motivate students. Now, a lot of teachers will reach for external motivators like grades or even stickers or sweets. But the most powerful student motivator is curiosity. Invest in that curiosity and you'll have students who are actually ready to learn. Rich tasks are designed to promote student curiosity by presenting a situation that begs to be explored and understood. When students are curious, they are ready to begin the productive struggle. And this is where they truly learn to be problem solvers and learners. Let's look at some launches. What do these teachers do to light their students' curiosity? How do they make the task irresistible? Today we're going to do a problem solving task, right? And it centers around the game, a game called One Two Nim, all right? So what I'll do in order to explain the game, I'll get you all to come up and, and have a stand around the front. So the rules of the game are very simple, okay? You can take either one or two counters on your turn, and the objective is to be the one who takes the last counter. Yeah. Who would like to challenge me, the Nim Master? Some volunteers? Yeah, beautiful. Grab a seat. Want to give it a go? Yeah. Would you like to go first or second? I'd like to go second. Mm -hmm. So I won the game, which is expected because I'm a master, but it's also cool because you get the chance to sort of steal my strategy, all right? Mm -hmm. Steal my tactics and make them your own, okay? Mm -hmm. um, can I ask you, when you got to three counters, yeah. what happened? Well, I knew I was losing. You knew you were losing? I've lost, actually. You knew you'd lost. Yeah. Do you think this is a game of chance no, or a no, game no. of skill? Skill. Skill. skill? Go back to your tables in groups of two or three and have a play. All right. I just want you to pick any whole number between 1 and 10 and then I want you to follow these steps. So take that first original number and add 2 to it. Then I want you to multiply your new answer by 2. Can you turn and talk to the people at your table and tell them what answer you got when you did this last step? You got the answer 1. Did anyone else get the same answer as Masood? Very interesting. So it may just be 1 to 10, but I'm not sure about the wider variety of all the numbers. Oh, that's good. That leaves me on to my next question. Choose a new number and have another go. Could you find a number that the final answer is not 1? Today, the focus is on squareable numbers. So a number is squareable if you can take that number of squares and cover a square with them. Is 9 squareable? Yes, it is. I've got a square here, and then I've divided it into nine little squares. Is the number 13 squareable? No. Does anyone who says no, are they able to tell me why they think it's not squareable? I love your ideas, it's awesome, but I'm going to tell you 13 is actually squareable. Why? We've got a square where the length and the width is the same, We've then got a larger, which is um, a square made up of four smaller squares. Do you agree now that 13 is squareable? Your job 
as a group is to find as many squareable numbers as possible between 1 and 30. Let's consider what we just saw there. When we launch rich tasks, we want to make the question clear and also compelling so we don't give away the answer. Our goal is to get students curious enough to actually dive into a productive struggle with the question. So we want to avoid resolving that struggle preemptively. Another thing to notice is that launches are concise. Students do the bulk of their learning when they're actually engaging with the problem on their own or with their groups. So that means we want to minimize the time spent launching a task. The teachers we saw also used certain techniques to get students curious. One of the other things that came into it was a little bit of a narrative and um, you know, I declared myself as the NIM master. Very brave of you, all right, to challenge the NIM master. And um, you know, that was to sort of really draw in those students that were kind of more competitive and um, you know, wanted to test their, their skills. And some of the students I hope found it funny as well, so that was, that was good too. A bit of humour helped, I think. When I asked the students did they think 13 was squareable, all of them said no. And then when I showed them, there were some students in sheer shock. Even though they were disagreeing with me that 13 could be squareable, I think it stirs up emotion inside that makes them want to either prove me wrong or to, to find other things and, and to own the problem themselves. In some cases, they would invite the students to play a game or try out a puzzle together. Sometimes they would use a strong visual or narrative element to the task. And often competition or collaboration can be strong motivators, depending on the students. In any case, once the students are engaged and curious, the teacher can let them get to work. In a sense, launching rich tasks is simple. We just light our students' curiosity and restrain ourselves from short-circuiting it. The launch isn't a time for hints or answers or strategies. It's a time to help students take the first step on a journey, even when they don't know where to lead. That's how we invest in helping our students become mature, independent problem solvers. In the next video, we'll explore strategies to help students build their persistence and stay engaged in productive struggle.